these days, if you open up the, the roster of the top shareholders in any public listed company, especially large cap, you will see the top five pretty much own 15 to uh, 20%. And from a uh, economics Nobel laureate, um, Professor Oliver Hart, who won a Nobel Prize a couple of years ago. So he recently uh, wrote quite an influential article, basically say, you know, the purpose of the, the company should not be maximize shareholder value per se as the, the market value, but maximize shareholder utility or shareholder welfare. So the argument is that suppose I am the sole shareholder of a company, obviously I would tell the CEO to do that's maximize my welfare, not necessarily maximize my wealth. So it's his argument that this should not change um, if, the sh if there are multiple shareholders. Now, um, as both professors pointed out, when a company is very diversely owned, it's very difficult to reach a consensus what the shareholder welfare utility is, and probably the common denominator is shareholder value. I think that's, that's a common understanding. But these days, because these top five um, top institutional shareholders, they are collectively pivotal in pretty much every proxy voting because they own 15 to 20%. So is it possible that the taste, the preference of the BlackRock, Fidelity, Vanguard, of course there's difference among them, but is it possible that the preference of these organizations would dominate the purpose of the company because they cast the vote and they pretty much determine which direction uh, the company is going. So are we at risk or maybe, you know, every year um, Larry Fink sent an educating letter to all the CEO telling them how to do good and do well, uh, but how is this directing us? Are these top five going to set up the right value system or should they also be focusing on the value because they're responsible, they have fiduciary duty to their own investors who are the ultimate beneficial owners of the company. So I'd very like to have some clarification on the issue. Mm -hmm. So I've been an academic for the last 30 years <laughs> and as you might imagine, as you probably know, right, the, the, prof the American professoriate leans left and sometimes very far left uh, and has all sorts of views about social justice and how society should be organized. And what you may not know is, of course, uh, we have pension money that has to be invested. And at any university, you have a choice of investment vehicles. You can invest in an index fund or something equivalent to an index fund, whether it be a Vanguard fund or some other fund. And on every menu, you'll find that there are the Calvert Social Investment Funds as well. And the Calvert Social Investment Funds have a different, uh, different goal. Uh, the, the index funds are trying to match market returns at the lowest possible cost. But the social investment funds are willing to, to sacrifice some return in order to achieve social goals. Not surprisingly, if you're cynical as I am, Overwhelmingly, regardless of where people are on the political spectrum, no matter how far on the left they are, they put their money not into the Calvert Social Investment Funds, but into the index funds. Because they're saving for their retirement too, and they want to get the highest returns, so that down the line they can afford to continue to hold their views and, and make their points and make the charitable contributions that they want to make. Uh, so almost without regard to, to one's political views, when it comes to one's personal investments, it is generally done in the way that the finance professors would predict. It's different, of course, when you're talking about university money, because there are few pleasures purer than giving away somebody else's money. <laughs> uh, and when it's about somebody else's money, one can indulge, one can pursue one's, one's goals without having to to, to bear the costs. What I worry about and what I think everybody should worry about is that as we're giving the asset managers all sorts of advice on how they should be actually furthering social goals and taking into account the, the interests of various stakeholders and departing from the fairly straightforward, if difficult, task of maximizing risk-adjusted returns at the lowest possible cost, that we better worry about the accountability at the asset managers, that when we t 
tell them we want them to do all these different things, many of which are in conflict with each other, just as one worries about accountability at the board level in a multi-stakeholder approach because any decision of any sort can be justified if you owe duties to an inconsistent set of, of interests. So too at the asset management level and even more at the asset management level does one, is one concerned with that. And it gets even worse because of the political salience of asset management. I, I was on a panel at the SEC and ended up not being able to say anything because Phil Graham, the, the former senator from, uh, from Texas, was on the panel and, and talked at great length. What did he talk about? It was a panel on proxy advisory firms, but he didn't actually care about proxy advisory firms. What he cared about was what the large asset managers were doing. And he made the following argument. He said, you liberals, to the people in the audience and listening online, he said, you liberals have these views on the environment and you tried to get your preferred environmental, he said, of course, with his Texas accent, which I'm not gonna try to mimic. Uh, you tried to get your environmental principles enacted into law and you lost in the legislature. And then you tried to get the courts to implement your preferred environmental policy and you lost in the courts. And now you're trying to implement your environmental policies using the assets of America's working peoples with the money that they're saving for retirement. And that's outrageous. You have no right to take your principles, your, your political views, and use America's workers' retirement assets to, to do that. And so what should happen, he thought, was that the asset managers should stick to their knitting and just try to increase returns for the workers. That political argument, I think, is an incredibly powerful political argument that if on the left we say we want workers to, to consider, we want firms to consider the interests of workers more, we want asset managers to, uh, to tell firms that they should they should give more to the workers, they should give greater share to the workers and so forth beyond what the labor markets uh, demand. You run the risk of the politicization of this because you know that Phil Graham is gonna come back with the alternative view. So, so I have um, on this set of points like, like three things to make, points, points to make. First, really following up um, on what, what Ed just said, the trade association of the public pension funds, um, which you know represents a trillion or so dollars in assets, vehemently opposed the business roundtable letter on the grounds that, wait a minute, these are retirement savings for public employees and, you know, trying to increase the ability of cities, municipalities, et cetera, to maximize those retirement payments is the only thing we should be concerned with. And this goes to the point, really, the difficult factual question as to who benefits from appreciation, from maximization of share, share value, what is uh, the incidence of the benefit of that, right? I think that's a very important and, and um, uh, questions, cer certainly. Secondly, many of the asset managers um, act on behalf of, of like ERISA, a Special Retirement Savings Plan for Employees, which require strict sole benefit rules for beneficiaries. So the only action that, that an asset manager who has responsibility for that pool the money can take is, strictly speaking, with, with respect to the sole benefit, i.e. financial benefit, of the beneficiary. The third point, and this is a point I'm thinking through right now, <clears throat> is what I call systematic stewardship. So if you are a universal investor, if you're a BlackRock um, with a portfolio uh, across the entire economy. Well, you know from finance theory um, that you improve welfare of your beneficiaries by um, 
uh, increasing expected returns and by reducing systematic risk. Well, expected returns means uh, not just at a firm specific level, because that's just what they call idiosyncratic. If you make one, com one competitor good, then maybe the other competitors are less, uh, make, make, make less money. Have you improved the portfolio results as a whole? Part of the argument on behalf of the activism is that if, if, if there's what I call kind of governor's externalities, if all these managers are under pressure, then they will all be, then collectively the economy is more productive and so it would increase expected return for a diversified investor. But the second point, and, and this is where, you know, I'm kind of working on this, is, is the notion of systematic risk. So if, if um, think about, say, climate change as a systematic risk, or think about, you know, gross income inequality as a systematic risk, which is to say the kind of or excessive risk taking by financial firms as a systematic risk, which is to say if the risk materializes in adverse ways, it's going to impose losses across the entire portfolio. And that systematic risk is going to be priced in an expectation and reduce the value of the portfolio. So, so, so you know, I, I think a, a possible way for these asset managers that Ed has described to think um, about what role they might play on some of these contested issues uh, that Senator Graham raises is this pure finance story that we can make it better for our beneficiaries if we lower these systematic risks and if a big systematic risk is uh, the, the, the incidence of cl climate change or the adverse results then maybe we as financial fiduciaries really ought to be thinking about that. Now, the implementation of that, you know, is, is kind of early innings, at least for me, and I don't disagree with Ed that if BlackRock, you know, took a bold stand on the grounds that, you know, we're gonna reduce systematic risk, that's what we're doing, and we, it's, it's not a question of trading off, it's just what we are obliged to do as a financial fiduciary, that would lead to pushback but notice, again, that takes us very far away. That kind of thinking takes us very far away from, in effect, the subject of the Business Roundtable letter, the Warren letter, which imagines, from my perspective, that you can solve these big issues on a firm-by-firm -firm basis, and the actions by specific management teams and boards is going to really be the way to make head headway here. And um, uh, one further point about that, and this is, this is um, in a sense, the Milton Friedman point, right, which, which he's kind of a bugaboo in this debate. So F Friedman's concern was that if uh, firms didn't think solely how to increase gains for the shareholders, to make more money for the shareholders, but were engaged in redistribution in, in, in some way, then pretty soon the next move is, well, wait a minute, why should this, why is, why, why should this board of directors going to be, you know, probably um, uh, men and women, increasingly women of, of significant wealth, social class, position, et cetera, why should they be making the distributional choices? And, and it, it then opens up the question, once you've given up on the narrow mission statement and you see a broad mission statement, then the governance arrangements as to who gets to make those decisions uh, 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 themselves become kind of open up. Um, and, and pretty soon firms are sort of engaged in a, a, a very broad social function. So, so this is the fr part of the Friedman defense of why I think only for the shareholders is not just because the normative considerations for the shareholders trump everybody. It's, you know, he had a view about the correct relationship between government and firms. And, and in, a, in a way he was in, in, in giving managers a narrow focus only 
he was trying to avoid getting them in the big questions of governance. I'm not defending that view particularly or saying that, that therefore boards don't have responsibility to make these trade-offs and in particular that asset managers shouldn't be thinking about systematic stewardship. I think that, but I'm just sort of trying to suggest uh, the broad range of considerations which, um, um, you know, the, the business roundtable letter begins to hint. Their, their theory of politics here is a pretty narrow theory of politics is all I'm suggesting. Um, anyway. So, so let, me, let me just follow up on that a little bit in terms of what is the politics, what I take to be the politics behind this statement. So if you take seriously the populist upsurge here and elsewhere in the world, and you, you think that it is related to sort of a hangover from the 2008 financial crisis and people sensing that the gains are not being fairly, uh, fairly shared, and you worry about intrusive mandatory federal regulation. What do you Elizabeth do? Elizabeth Warren statute, right? What do you do? Elizabeth Warren statute. What do you do? What is the private sector? What is the private sector response that can preempt or avoid something like Elizabeth Warren's Accountable Capitalism Act? So what's the answer to that? The, the, what's, what I see happening is the sense that there needs to be a new arrangement among the private actors, the firms and the asset managers, in which there will be some way, undefined exactly how, that will there, there will be a more equitable allocation of gains such that it will relieve the political pressure for more intrusive mandatory regulation. What a, my co-teacher at my seminar, Marty Lipton, refers to as a new paradigm. And he's been pushing a new paradigm that essentially is meant to be a, a new settlement between the largest shareholders and the firms to encourage and facilitate long-term in, uh, investment and to facilitate greater gain sharing with employees, with the trade-off being greater breathing room provided by the shareholders. That's what the new paradigm is trying to accomplish. And it's trying to accomplish it in order to preempt or avoid something like the Accountable Capitalism Act. Now, I think, I think that's an accurate description of what they're about. It raises the question of whether it's good politics or bad politics, whether it stands a chance of, if there is a sufficient populist wave to ultimately elect Elizabeth Warren and we get to 2021 and she looks at the business roundtable letter and says, you guys pro promulgated this two years ago, but nothing's changed. Now we need to, we, we're, agree, we're in agreement on what the corporation should do it, should deliver value to the customers, invest employees, deal fairly and ethically with suppliers, support communities, and generate long-term value. I've got a plan for how to do that with mandatory employee representation and a variety of other things. What I worry about in terms of the political, uh, the political sustainability and wisdom of something like the New Paradigm or the Business Roundtable letter is, is the Milton Friedman worry, which is that you've, as soon as you give up the, the pole star of furthering shareholder value and concede, as one can read the Business Roundtable statement as doing, that corporations owe obligations to all the stakeholders, that in the political debate, in the political debate, you've given up the best argument for the private solution. So I precisely um, um, want to follow up on that because um, um, when we read um, Senator Warren's letter, the, the, the phrase repeated five times is concrete steps. So basically she challenged the business leaders say, you pro promised us this, 
but exactly what are the concrete steps um, that you'll be taking. Um, so, you know, Professor Rock, you talk about the settlement between the shareholders and corporations uh, to do certain do do certain good so to preempt or to avoid a more intrusive uh, level of regulation, government intervention. So my question would it be, is this settlement really feasible? Because under the current governance system, you know, the, the, the shareholders still get elected the board meetings, voted on proxy, they could launch a proxy context. There could be a hostile takeover and the takeover, you know, the, the directors have to follow strictly the fiduciary duty for the shareholder benefit. So under the current governance rule, can this settlement, how this settlement could be uh, feasible? And if not, is it feasible for a presidential candidate or a, even a president to change the rule to elect board directors to make it have to be representatives of non-shareholders such as employees? It, it does happen elsewhere in the world. So I just wonder whether this is even feasible in the US. Well, the law could change. <laughs> Uh, and then there would obviously be a period of, of adjustment as firms learned how to, to function with that. German firms have co mandatory co-determination for the largest public <laughs> firms, and they do very well. But there are a lot of things that are different in Germany. Mm -hmm. Labor unions play a different role in Germany. They have institutions like the works councils that bring in uh, employee voice in a variety of ways and so forth. So you can run a very successful economy with co-determination. It would take a period of time for us to do it. Right, so, so um, I, I guess I, I, I start um, on this with, with a, a different point of view, which is um, income inequality and wealth inequality has not so much to do with large firms in the United States. So um, uh, they're, they're first, Inequality in the United States has two different dimensions. One of which is uh, the hockey stick, the point oh oh one percent, and everybody else. Um, that has nothing to do with the public firm, and it has everything to do with um, the fact that a lot of economic activity occurs in a pri private business where there are owners who, um, are, who have a lot of money, and that's where the wealth is. The latest tax data suggests, really, it's the flow-through enterprise of the firms that are not even listed where the substantial wealth disparities really exist. So nothing that's going to affect the public firm is going to touch on that. Secondly, the income inequality debate in the United States, again, has um, two different dimensions, one of which is between, again, the, the hockey stick at the far right-hand side, the 0.01 percent, um, where the end, the number of, of the really wealthy is relatively small and the actual total dollar is substantial, but still, um, across the broad economy, um, not so huge. The big, the big inequality concern, income and wealth, is between those uh, without, uh, um, with just a high school or less, or less education and those um, with college and more education. And, and if you look at the, the sort of the, the lines, uh, the, the, non, uh, the high school and below, um, wages and um, have been flat or declining over a long period of time. Um, college and above have with different degrees. Uh, the, the slope of increase is positive with different levels of positivity. That inequality gap has, again, it's, it's not really touched on by 
the business roundtable letter or any reform geared to that. And, and so my, my concern is that what's um, sort of, um, I mean, if you think, if you're concerned about the output of how this economic system has, is, is producing, um, is, is, is the governance of these firms really the right way? Is, is that the lever? Is that the Archimedean point? Is that the catalytic point where the transformation or a big change can occur? And, and you know, I'm, I'm drawn as I think about this to, there was a, a very famous exchange in, in uh, the Davos meetings this past year where they had a, a Dutch economist who was on this panel discussing wealth inequality, uh, wealth inequality and income inequality. And they were discussing some of these governance issues and he said, you know what, it's taxes, um, it's, it's the estate tax, it's the income tax, it's other taxes, and if you're not prepared to address those, then the rest is BS and you're kidding yourself. And so, you know, I mean, Ed and I have both got 30 years investment in this field and we want it to be sort of the most important field possible to determine social outcomes. But I also think um, you got to be realistic about the tools that you're using, um, which isn't to say that the governance questions and how firms behave, um, and in particular firms in the multinational space behave. So I was talking just earlier with Todd Baker, who's sitting over there, and we agreed that actually, you know, figuring out how to avoid uh, the multinational shifting income to low tax jurisdictions would be enormously beneficial at addressing many social questions because that's how you're going to gin up resources to address them. That's not a governance question, right? Or it's not a corporate governance question. And, and um, uh, climate change also. Um, uh, maybe my systematic stewardship provides some lever for large owners to play a positive role. But, you know, but again, that, that's not involved. If you look at Elizabeth's letter, it doesn't touch on that question at all. You know, it's just sort of worrying about communities and suppliers and employees. With all respect, that's kind of second order to you know, the existential threat the, the climate change presents.